This is no ordinary missing persons case. I've never quite seen a case like this in 20 years of doing this. This case has spun out of control. Despite the drama and rumors playing out on television and social media, one sad truth remains clear. A young girl is missing in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and no one can find her. Now Crime Watch Delhi takes you inside the shocking series of events that shattered lives and has torn a community apart. Bring the truth. Bring justice. Just tell us what we need to know about our daughter. Terry Elvis's daughter is 20-year-old Heather, a hostess at a popular restaurant in Myrtle Beach. Her proud parents are so excited about Heather's future. Their little girl is all grown up and ready to take on the world. She loved working. I don't know what it was about Heather, but work was her driving force. But her passion was doing makeup. She was very artsy, and that's what she really loved. But hiding in the shadow of Heather's bright future, there's a dark secret. She was like, do you see him? And I was like, who? And she was like, Sydney. And I was like, who is Sydney? And she was like, that guy over there, the maintenance guy. Brianna Wallerman was Heather's roommate and best friend. She's breaking her silence about Heather's disappearance in this exclusive interview with Crime Watch Daily. Brianna says they met when Sydney was hired to do maintenance work at her job. Even though Sydney was 38, almost twice Heather's age, it was love at first sight, at least for Heather. Even after that day, the day that they first started talking, like over a series of weeks, it was her running and being like, Brie, Sydney did this and we're going to do this and we hung out here and every time he would come in, she would almost like run away because it was like, oh, you know, like Sydney's here kind of thing. Heather's romance with Sydney was very intense. When it came to Heather, he made her feel like she was his one and only. She told me she loved him. But there's one big problem. Sydney is a married man. According to Brianna, Sydney's wife, Tammy, knew about the affair and warned Heather in calls and text messages to stay away from her man. It read in part, someone's about to get their beat down. Your is about to take his last breath. When the whole thing was found out, it blew up like a bomb almost. I mean, Tammy was livid, texting Heather. She was sending Heather pictures of her and Sydney having sex. I personally never saw them because I told her I did not want to. Tammy, her phone calls, you know, you're gonna stop talking to my husband or else. And it wasn't, or else I'm going to do this. It was, or else. According to Brianna, Tammy made sure Heather got the message loud and clear. Tammy called Heather. She said, you're gonna end it with my husband. So she put Sydney on the phone and sat there while Sydney and Heather talked and they ended things on the phone. But Sydney made comments to Heather and said, you know, you were nothing to me. You were just someone who spread your legs and basically tore Heather apart as a human being. Brianna says it crushed Heather. It was two months full of tears. Then Heather showed signs of moving on. She called Brianna and told her she was going out on a date. It was supposed to be the first official date since after her relationship with Sydney had ended. I asked her what they were going to do and she was like, I'm not sure, but I'm just excited. Heather was happy that night and let those close to her know it. She texted me during the date. She said, my date is teaching me how to drive a manual car. Yeah, I got a text from her and it was a picture of her driving a truck. And it says, look at me, I'm a pro. It would be the very last picture anyone would see of Heather. Heather's date dropped her off at the apartment around 1 a.m. At 1.44 a.m., Brianna gets an emotional call from Heather. She was crying. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me Sydney had called her. Brianna was floored when Heather told her why he called. He said that he left his wife and that he missed me and he wanted to see me. And she was like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, well, how about you sleep on it? She was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna go to sleep and I'll talk to you tomorrow. And we always end our conversation with love you. So we said love you, hung up, and that was the last time I talked to her. 
According to a police timeline, Heather then left her apartment and drove to the Peachtree Landing, a popular place for fishermen and kayakers. Peachtree Boat Landing is a dark and desolate wooded area. Certainly at night, Peachtree Landing doesn't get a lot of uh, attention or traffic by any means. Phone records show she pinged there at 3.38 a.m. It was the last time anyone heard anything from Heather. Less than 24 hours later, police get a call of a suspicious vehicle parked oddly at Peachtree Landing. It's Heather Elvis's car, registered to her father, Terry. What did you find when you got here? I came with the officer to identify the car and to open it for him. I had the spare keys to it. We have spare keys to all of our cars, you know, locked up at home. So we got here, we found the car, we opened the car, the officer went through it, and uh, he found receipts uh, time stamped earlier that day, and uh, that's pretty much it. Heather had vanished, along with her car keys, purse, and cell phone. Did you try calling her at that point? Oh, yes. we. Over and over. We and call over, over and over and over, and it just it went, went straight, straight to straight voicemail voice every time. The Horry County Police first want to meet with the last person Heather called or texted. Police reports show that was Sydney Moore. Heather's dad wants answers too. Did you know Sydney Moore? Never heard the name before, not once. Ne not even one time. Never. That night when we're going through the phone records, and it was. Did it you want to call him? I actually did call him. You called Sydney Moore? I, I texted him that night and I said, please call me, it's important. Did he call you? Texted back a little bit later and it says, uh, I think the text said, who is this? And I immediately called the phone back and he answered the phone and I told him who I was. And what did he say? Uh, he began to curse me profusely. I said, hey, I just want to know where my daughter's at. You, you were the last person to talk to her on the phone. I've never known your daughter. I never spoke to her, blah, 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 blah. I just kept going on and on. He said he didn't know your daughter. Yeah, I said, I said, man, I said, you've got children too. I said, this is my daughter. And he says, don't you threaten my child, and, and he hangs up the phone. Cops question Sydney. He first tells them he has not spoken to Heather for at least two months. Phone records show that's a lie. Authorities say that they then presented the cell phone log that they say shows that he called her the night she went missing. A police report shows Sidney then changed his story, admitting he did speak to Heather, but only to tell her to quit calling him. Police then tracked down Heather's date that night. He was the last known person to have seen her. But after an interrogation, he's been cleared. The investigation leads back to Sidney and his wife, Tammy, but they both claim they were not at Peachtree Landing the night Heather goes missing. But now the whole community wants answers. Tens of thousands of people devastated for the loss of Heather. On the Find Heather Elvis Facebook page that her family set up, I mean, countless posts uh, from around the world. Tammy made a post on Facebook too. It was chilling, saying in part, quote, well, Sydney cheated on me in the months of September, October with a psycho whore who has since went missing. Then the search for Heather goes from sad to bizarre, and at times, downright scary. 20-year-old Heather Elvis is missing. Police locate her car at a place called Peachtree Landing, just outside Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. But there is no sign of Heather. Her family panics, and thousands join the search. I just think we all like to know that our children are safe. Suddenly, there's a bombshell. Heather was in the middle of a twisted love triangle with a married man named Sidney Moore. Police say his wife, Tammy, found out and wasn't happy. One report shows she actually handcuffed her husband to the bed at night. Cops claim Tammy repeatedly called and texted threatening Heather. One text read, quote, I've been having Sidney followed since January 2012. It's best you call back and speak to me. Save yourself. Hey. You ready to meet the missus? Once the affair services, it sounds like a lot of people are going after Tammy Moore and Sydney Moore. On social media, it's a storm. 
of course our system works, you're innocent until proven guilty, and a lot of people posting these people are guilty. Social media surrounding the case explodes. Not only are fingers being pointed at Sydney and Tammy Moore, but believe it or not, some social media trolls are taking pot shots at Heather, her family, and even her friends, either in their support for the Moors or simply to demean them for no reason at all. Social media has really been such a major part of Heather's case and not in a positive way. Some positive, mostly negative. Mostly negative. I oh, mean, yes. it's really kind of dragged you through the mud. It has really put a black cloud over top of everything else that you're having to go through. It takes away from the focus of the case. It, it's, it's a total distraction, waste of time. I have been called a liar. I've been told that she went to New Jersey with me. I've been told that I fabricated the text messages that I have. I fabricated the phone calls, that I'm in on it, that I know where she is. I've been told that I played a part in her disappearance. There's people that still message me today and with the most crazy accusations of what they think happened. And accusations back and forth I've never seen before in covering these types of stories. You never quite see it get to this level. Then another bizarre twist. A little more than a month after Heather goes missing, cops shift their focus on two men in South Carolina. And get this, one of the men is friends with Heather's father. Police accuse Bill Barrett, who had organized fundraisers and searchers to find Heather, of going too far. He reached out to uh, a witness in the case and basically tried to conduct his parallel investigation with ours. Um, and that, in doing that, it interfered with our investigation. So many people were, were not willing to come forward and talk to the police, but they'd come tell me. And I'd say, well, here, please, just call the tip line. Cops claim Bill Barrett also uncovered potential evidence and did not immediately report it. You do what you have to do sometimes. Uh, did I do it intentionally say I'm going to break a law? No, sir. Police also arrest Garrett Starnes, a Myrtle Beach resident who took interest in the case. Maybe a little too much interest. The cops claim he fabricated misleading information about Heather Elvis's disappearance and then sent it to law enforcement. Both men were charged with obstruction of justice. Starnes' case was dismissed, but Bill Barrett's day in court is still pending. The intensity, the community feeling impacted by this, feeling vested personally in the loss of Heather since she went missing is unlike any case that I've seen. Just when it seems this case can't get any stranger, another shocking headline. Heather's father, Terry Elvis, and his family are threatened. Terry Elvis uh, filed a police report with Myrtle Beach Police and said that two men in a Jeep came up to him in the back of his parking lot where he was leaving work and yelled to him, we already have Heather, Morgan is next referring to Morgan Terry's other daughter. That case, we're told, is still active. No arrests yet have been made in that case. It's never clear who threatened Terry and why. As sympathy grows for Heather's family, public hatred is mounting for Sidney and Tammy Mora. He files police reports alleging someone took a shot at his family, not once, but twice. Sidney Moore was traveling with his family, and he says uh, while he was driving, a vehicle was following him rather closely for a little while, and he heard what he said sounded like two gunshots. After that, he said he noticed that the vehicle slowed down dramatically and then turned off their headlights. About two weeks later, Sidney Moore files another report, this one in Myrtle Beach, it alleges that about 1.30 in the morning uh, that he saw two men approach him in another vehicle uh, and appeared to put a shotgun up toward him through their vehicle. Uh, he says that he was able to go to a nearby location and lock himself in that building until police arrived. Just hours after Sydney's second run-in with a gunman, the cops show up at his house with a search warrant. They went in. The term that's been used is shock and awe. Authorities kind of storm in there with dozens of police cars and go in there and seize all this information. They did seize some property from the home. They seized some guns, um, some DVDs. Sydney and Tammy are both arrested and charged with obstruction of justice. But in a real shocker, they're also charged with two counts of indecent exposure. We later learned that the indecent exposure charge was apparently as their defense attorney puts it, marital relations in public. 
That's right. Part of their defense is they were having sex in their truck about the time Heather Elvis disappeared. Police aren't buying it because a few days after Sydney and Tammy Moore are arrested, they are handed down new charges. The kidnapping and murder of Heather Elvis. The disappearance of 20-year-old Heather Elvis is a mystery that's puzzled police in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. She vanished in the early morning hours. All that remained was her car, parked in an eerie place called Peachtree Landing. I definitely think Heather went to Peachtree with intentions to meet someone that she knew and that she trusted. I don't think that she would have went to the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night just because. Thousands in South Carolina join police looking for Heather. They search for months. Then the Horry County Police Department arrests two people. Charges of murder in the disappearance of 20-year-old Heather Elvis have now been leveled against Tammy and Sydney Moyer. Sydney Moore had an affair with Heather. Police say his wife Tammy threatened her. They're charged with the kidnapping and murder of Heather Elvis. I am beyond 100% sure that the, the people that are charged are the ones that they need to be charging with it uh, since day one. The Moors are also charged with obstruction of justice and strangely enough, indecent exposure. That was part of their alibi when first questioned by the cops. A police report shows the Moors claimed they were having sex in their car when Heather went missing. Now the accused deadly duo want everyone to know their arrest has been a rush to judgment. I would just urge people not to uh, reach a conclusion, but not to assume that someone's guilty uh, simply because they've been arrested and charged. It's being put to me, if your client didn't do it, who did it? And that's a very bizarre thing to say. And some are asking, how can there be a murder charge without a body? Just because you can't find a body doesn't mean that the person hadn't been murdered. The prosecution's evidence against the Moors is all circumstantial. They have numerous threatening texts from Tammy to Heather to end the affair with her husband, Sydney. One text read in part, quote, someone's about to get their beat down. Your is about to take his last breath. You can tell me where you are right now, or I will find out another way. That way won't have a great turnout for you. I'm giving you one last chance to answer before we meet in person, only one. Prosecutors say Tammy's jealousy was so intense, she sometimes handcuffed Sydney to the bed at night. But is that enough for a murder conviction? It doesn't mean anything in terms of evidence or, or intention or, or proof. The prosecution came up with a timeline during those crucial hours before Heather disappeared. Here's what they think happened based on phone records, witness statements, and video evidence. 1.35 a.m., police allege Cindy Moore called Heather from a payphone. The call lasts for almost five minutes. At 1.44 a.m., police also say Heather then calls her friend Brianna. She told me Sydney had called her. He said that he left his wife and that he missed me and he wanted to see me. Phone records indicate Heather calls Sydney's cell phone at 3.17 a.m. Prosecutors determine that Heather is still at her apartment and that Sydney is still at his house. Authorities believe after that conversation, Heather gets into her car and then drives three miles to Peachtree Landing. At 3.36 a.m., a private residence camera captures a dark colored truck coming from the direction of Sydney's house, heading towards Peachtree Landing. Another camera at a business location records the truck getting closer to Heather's location. Heather's cell phone pings show she is now parked at Peachtree Landing and repeatedly calls Sydney's cell phone from 3.38 a.m. to 3.40 a.m. And the last call that Heather makes that's live is 3.41 a.m. And that's a one minute call or an attempted call. And authorities say that the phone goes dead shortly after that. There's no other data from her phone. Around 3.46 a.m., the same black truck ID'd by police is the same vehicle heading back in the direction of the Moore's house. Again, the video surveillance cameras capture it all. The police believe that the black truck 
belong to Sydney and Tammy Moore. The couple does own a black truck similar to what was caught on camera. The defense, of course, saying there are a number of black trucks that might travel this road. Uh, how can you be so sure that it was Sydney's truck? We don't believe it was. Sydney and Tammy had been held without bond for several months. Their attorneys convince a judge to allow them out for $100,000 each. Jimmy, how do you have to jail right now? They've got to wear GPS monitoring and they can't, they've got to be within a five mile, outside of a five mile radius of Heather Elvis's family and no contact with the Ellis family as well. It's now been almost two years since Heather went missing and the most talked about murder trial in South Carolina has not begun. Numerous delays have only increased speculation as to the strength of the prosecution's case. Whether a trial happens or not, we may never know what happened to Heather Elvis. And this one is an absolute stunner. A judge allows Sydney and Tammy to move from their home in South Carolina to Florida until the start of the trial. Tammy and Sydney's attorneys argued to the judge that they needed work, uh, that, that Sydney needed work and had an option or an opportunity to apply for a job in Florida. I don't see how someone who is charged with murder at the end of the day should be allowed to leave the state. I was beyond outraged when I heard it. Um, I'm numb to it at this point. Because you I, I, have to live every day without your daughter, so why should they have to? Yes. Uh, it's, it's, to me, it's like rewarding them. I, I don't understand it. Despite all the drama and all the distractions, Heather Elvis is still missing. So many people who either know or don't know her want her to come home today. And if someone has killed her, justice must prevail. If Heather could hear this today, or if she's watching or, or anything, what would be your message to her? I would love for Heather to be at home right now. I would give anything for Heather to be at home right now. We'll never give up. We'll never stop searching. We'll never stop looking. We'll never stop asking questions.